It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, where each week we seek inspiration from great men and women to become the heroes or heroines of our own lives. So you are here with your hosts. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great, Andy, today. Ready to celebrate one of the first aristocrats. We hardly do nobility uh, in this program. It tends to be self-made people, but this man carved out his own destiny, that's for sure. We want to give it up for America's favorite fighting Frenchman, as they say in the Hamilton musical. And you know who we're talking about. Yes, we are talking about Gilbert de Motier, right? Otherwise known as the Marquis de Lafayette. Yeah, really, we're your towering hero in two different revolutions seeking, you know, freedom and, and individual rights from, from my respective, you know, the British and, the, and French monarchies. Yeah, he is a towering figure in the battle for, for uh, personal liberties and individual rights. Yeah, Andy, so some of the things we want to talk about is aristocrats who have the, the opportunity to just stand on the sidelines and live in this quote privileged type of society what about when they actually stand up for principles you know what can that lead to so we're going to talk about lafayette also how do heroes he was a hero worshiper uh certainly of george washington and how did that impact both of their lives and then the next thing would be the difference he fought in both the american and French revolutions. And I want to kind of unpack the differences between the two and the results, even in his own life and how he was treated throughout both revolutions. The main reason we celebrate Lafayette amongst all of his myriad achievements is, you know, as, as here he is a French aristocrat, part of the ancient regime, you know, the ancien regime that's been persecuting commoners for a thousand years. And yet he's, he's, a, he's a figure of the enlightenment, you know, you know and, and, and a believer in, the, in the, what they call the rights of man during the 18th century. And he's just, he's just, he's filled with hope by what he sees going on across the pond. You know, that the American Revolution is right. The Americans are rising up for freedom against the British British crown. And Lafayette wants to, as a very young man, he wants to get involved in this. Not so much, now correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm sure you know more about Lafayette than I do, but not so much from uh, wanting, the, wanting the weak in France's blood enemy, Great Britain, which, which motivates other Frenchmen, but more for the principles of the American Revolution. That, that that's what's more absolutely Andy v uh, very good point because Lafayette he could have had that motive because when he was two years old his father was killed during the French and Indian War so the British did kill his father and he had a long lineage of military glory dating back to Joan, Joan of Arc but he had no battlefield experience he's 19 years old against the king's wishes he defied the king and he's like I'm going to America and I'm going to fight for this incredible cause of liberty, which is not like anything that's ever existed in history. And I want to meet George Washington. There's a bunch of people, other aristocrats who go, they want this title and just stand in the background and not really do anything. But he, so he goes to Philadelphia and they're like, we've, we've seen enough of your type. And he says, I'll fight for free. I'm not going to demand any pay. I'm, I'm going to fight for free. And I want to fight under George Washington. Right. And it's an amazing story because he's a kid, you know, he's like 19 at, at this point. Like you said, yeah, he's, he's got no battlefield experience. He doesn't speak English, uh, you, you, you know, and, uh, and yet, and yet he's, uh, you know, he's just inflamed by the, by the principles of, of the American Revolution. And he comes to, he comes to fight for liberty. That, that, all, that in itself makes him, you know, an extraordinary person. But, you know, he learns to speak English quickly, right, when he's in, when he's in America. He, uh, he, he, get, he gets a commission as, a, was as a general, but, but he has no, they don't give him a command. But but he he eventually gets a command and he distinguishes himself on the battlefield. Right, he's uh, wounded at Brandywine. He's uh, he, you know, he turns out to be a very good command, military commander. He jumps right in with no battlefield experience. Now he had some military training when he was thirteen. He started with what was called the Black Musketeers, which was the Three Musketeers novel came out of that that uh, group. 
But he jumps right in, Brandywine, the British want to take over Philadelphia. They already have New York, and they figure if we have New York and Philadelphia, we have the colonies. He jumps into battle, and uh, the, they are retreating. He's like, no, let's, let's do this in orderly. And he gets off his horse, gets shot in the leg, and this lumbers on. You know, and Washington in the distance sees this happening. And when he gets, to, he brings his own doctor. And when he sees Lafayette, uh, he tells the doctor, treat him as if he's my own son. So now we're seeing like the bond. Fast forwarded the relationship between these two. But right from the get-go, Andy, he proves himself on the field and then is given uh, a battlefield command. He suffers through Valley Forge. Right. This is with everyone else starving and shoeless. And he, he, you know, he finds ways to boost morale on top of that. But here he is, the French aristocrat used to, you know, very you know, upscale kind of living. But he toughs it out with Washington and the and the men, you know, showing real, real dedication to the to the cause of liberty. I mean, it's an amazing story. The French aristocrat who's fighting for liberty and under these most brutal conditions and he stays the course. I mean, it's, it's tremendously heroic. And admirable. This man is, he has a moral purpose here, you know, identified uh, by the Declaration of Independence. He sees an opportunity for liberty and the British are after him, Andy. They know who he is and they know if they get Lafayette, I mean, Washington is like the top gun they're after, but if they get Lafayette, they could destroy the morale of France. They can continue this onslaught uh, of which they are in the midst of. And uh, a couple of months later in the, in, the, in the sweltering heat of Monmouth, Monmouth, New Jersey, the Battle of Monmouth, Washington gives General Lee the command for there and Lee is just botching the job. But Lafayette comes in and, say, and, and salvages. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a victory or a defeat. It, it ended up being a draw, but it was because of uh, Lafayette's valor. He saved the Americans from a crushing defeat at Monmouth, as I... As I... That's right. He's, he helped save the Americans from crushing defeat. Then after the uh, Battle of Saratoga, which happened shortly after that, he finally gets the buy-in from the French to take part in this you know now that he's the french have seen an american victory of course their motive is to get back at the brits okay their, their ulterior motive is to get back at the brits and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we when we distinguish american and french revolution the the bourbon monarchy had no interest in promoting freedom right liberty or individual rights they wanted to weaken their great britain their blood enemy for centuries that was that was their motive but it wasn't lafayette's Exactly. Constantly putting his life on the line for, again, for no pay. Let's, let's be clear. This is not altruism. He realizes they can't afford to pay him. He doesn't want to bankrupt an already starving South uh, country that had, that has no, uh, no money right now, but he sees what Liberty entails and, and goes to fight. And then finally in October of 1781, Washington gives him a battlefield command, the decisive victory, both he and Hamilton surround the British, Cornwallis's troops, and that's the ultimate victory, British surrender, and that's it. The, you know, the war is over. Two years later, Treaty of Paris, he takes part in that. That's, you know, that's enough right there to make him deserving of an episode on the Hero Show. But then he goes back to France and he participates in the you know, in the French Revolution. So he goes back to France and he sails back wearing an American uniform, the military uniform of the Americans. And they greet him, job well done. Now we're into the 1790s. The French Revolution is brewing. He's fighting for the rights of man in, in France. He wants heroes in both continents, you know, both uh, the Americas and in Europe. And he attempts, the French Revolution is taken over by the mob, Robespierre, uh, is ready to throw him in jail. He's stripped. Much different culture, but we should we should emphasize, you know, the Declaration of, of R the Rights of Man and, and the Citizens, I think was the title, uh, based on the uh, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. He and Jefferson were buddies by that time. Jefferson had input into it, into that first draft that Lafayette, the Lafayette wrote, other people, you know, later on subsequently uh, edited it. 
but you know it was a statement uh, in 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 support of the the rights of man of indiv uh, the, you know individual rights personal liberties the lafayette wanted to bring wanted to bring to france his native france after ha having risked his life to fight for it across the pond in america so here he is you know here he is you know that's why he's known as the hero of two worlds right the hero on on, on both sides both hero of liberty on both sides of the pond and of course you're right Robin, of, of course, the uh, the I don't even call them radicals. It's but the the murderers, the butchers, take over the French Revolution. The Robespierre, Danton, you know, and, and so forth. And the order goes out for Lafayette's arrest. Fortunately, he he's he's able to get wind of that. He flees into the Netherlands, which was you know Austrian territory. Where he's he's arrested by the Austrians and in prison for five years. Uh, but better than better than that, he. Yeah, better than if he had been captured in, in France because they would have guillotined them. You know, they would have, so so he survived, and you know, the, and the Austrians eventually you know let it, let him out. Nap actually, Napoleon Napoleon came in. Yeah, Napoleon came in 1799 and and was able to release him, but Lafayette saw the difference. So this man knew George Washington and he knew Napoleon like personally. And he saw the difference between American and French revolutions where one man, how often do we say it, Andy? One man is constantly <laughs> refusing power to be handed to him because he just he just wants to go home and work on his farm and be a businessman. But the European mindset, which is, you know, one form of bloody conquest. And when Lafayette sees that, he's like, no, uh, I, I want no part of this. And Napoleon wants him for di to be the diplomat to America. And he says, I don't want to be on the opposite side of the table with my friends. I'm not going to be negotiating, trying to rip them off in effect. If we even just go back historically, just uh, the American mindset was I'm a sovereign individual. And the European mindset, and even in the Far East, if we go the global mindset outside of America was, I am not a sovereign, I am a subject of the king, the church. Somebody else is above me and I am a, a loyal subject. So I think that was that was one reason why uh, the idea of reason took hold one place and not the other. Right, I, that's a good point. It's, I, it's not a history, Britain was always freer, or at least had long been freer than any of the continental nations. Is it a historic accident that the greatest revolution in support of liberty takes place by British colonists and British subjects? You know, not at all. You know, Locke's influence is strong here, but uh, but also Britain had Britain had been freer and had a you know had a, a heritage of 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 greater freedom going back to the magna carta you know that was uh, surpassed any anything like anything like that on on the continent i just want to say one last thing about Locke in the epistemology you know and how human beings gain knowledge he was a thoroughgoing empiricist you know meaning all knowledge originates in observation well if all knowledge originates in observation that's something that every man and every woman can do uh, say as distinct from plato uh, descartes who believe that you get innate ideas from a higher world or, or from God, and consequently to gain knowledge, we have to study. We have to study the the higher world to really you know de de develop the ideas that are implanted in our mind from God or you know or whatever. Well, who studies the higher world? You know, most of us are too busy making a living, taking care of our kids and stuff. Who studies the higher world? Are the philosophers, the Plato, or the you know clergy to to Descartes? And if the, if the moral laws from the higher world are to be enacted in this world, then they're the ones who need to go. You need the philosopher king, or you need a, a theocracy, or you at least need the church as a big part of the of the of the regime, as as we saw the ancient regime as in France. Whereas on the empirical model, if uh, you know, if 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 all knowledge originates in observation, every man, every woman could do that, and they could gain knowledge and guide their own lives, especially if the if the ancient regime doesn't doesn't uh violate their right to seek an education and so the Lockean idea of you know observation based knowledge leads to the principle that you know that that we could be rational beings we can gain knowledge every man can you know can gain knowledge and we could be self-governing beings we can govern our own lives we don't need the clergy or the king or the aristocrats to tell us what to do in fact we don't want we don't want them to tell us what to do we're, we're, because we could be rational, knowledgeable, self-governing beings. So I think Locke's influence in, in, in the English-speaking world was a lot stronger than, than anywhere else, including in France. Uh, good for us, you know, uh, unfortunate, unfortunate for, for France.
So you're watching The Hero Show brought to you by Objective Standard Institute. You can go to our website, share and like this with objectivestandard.org. We have courses, we have other podcasts. Now, Andy, let's talk a little bit about uh, his biography, his dates. 1757 to 1834, the hero of two worlds, you know, fought for liberty and Two diff on two different continents. France is a dominant power when he's born. They are a dominant power in Europe. Uh, you know, not, not too long before was the Sun King Louis the Fourteenth, who just wanted to rule everything, uh, take over in, uh, all of Europe, and. Because Lafayette, uh, as I said earlier, his father died when he was two, his, his mother died when he was like 12, 13, goes into the military, but he reads about heroes and he's enamored with this concept of liberty and that's coming out of the enlightenment. And also he was sickened by the aristocracy. They were lazy. They had no purpose in life. Other than to oppress the commoners. Yes, and he and when he went back to France, so so, just real fast, we covered a lot of his American uh, impact. But one of the things that cemented him with with uh, George Washington, so this idea of having a, of hero worshiping, he goes not even knowing who Washington is, but the stature of Washington is already embedded in him in in Lafayette. Like I have to meet this man. They meet. They hit it off, and one of the pivotal moments was uh, the Conway Cabal. Washington was losing battle after battle, and he wasn't exactly losing. He was doing the duck and run. The Congress is their confidence in Washington is, is suffering, and so Lafayette is one of the people that they that uh, they get together to try to replace Washington. And they're asking his, you know, what, what do you think? And he stands up and basically they want to toast basically to replace Washington. And Lafayette's like, no. Uh, George Washington is the man. He's the leader. If anyone is going to do it, it will be him. So this idea of hero worship, Andy, I wanted to just kind of unpack that. How this leads people to do, it's the whole purpose of the show, right? It's not just to glorify these people and then, you know, read books and then do nothing in our lives. It's actually for the purpose of taking action. And that's what Lafayette did in having Washington as a role model. Yeah, yeah, and turning down power the way Washington did, because back in France, after, after the Bourbon re restoration, you know, the, and the, the kings are restored, he becomes a, a liberal member of the uh, Chamber of Deputies, liberal meaning in the true word, support of liberty. Uh, and then it was the Fran France went through the July Revolt in, in 1830. There were people in France wanted, wanted to offer him the, the chance to become dictator, you know, and he turned it down. He just... Uh, he flat out refused that power the way George Washington had done twice. Uh, you know, Washington, of course, turned it down, resigned his military commission after winning the War of Independence, and then resigned from the presidency after two terms, refusing, you know, power seeking. And Lafayette, like his mentor and, and brother, George Washington, turns down power in, in, in France supports uh, Louis Philippe as king, and then turns against him when the king becomes a, a dictator, when the king becomes an autocrat, Lafayette uh, you know, you know, uh, tur turns against him. So uh, we see a, a principled supporter of liberty in, in Lafayette on two continents, what he's known as the, the hero of, of two worlds. And I love the fact that where he's buried in Paris is under the soil from Bunker Hill in, in Massachusetts. Before we get to his death, Andy, just a couple of more things. Because uh, so abolition, he knew a lot of uh, slave owners, and he might, uh, in my estimation, I think Hamilton and Lafayette persuaded George Washington to free his slaves upon death. They they, they had his ear. Then they told he heard enough about abolition from those two surrogate sons of his that he could not do it in his own lifetime but there's there, there's a reason washington is the only founder from founding slave owner who actually did uh um, free his slaves upon upon death and lafayette bought uh, a section um i think it was a french guyana someplace in the caribbean simply for the purpose of freeing the slaves who were on this one uh, he bought like a, a property simply for the purpose of freeing the slaves. So this was dear to his heart because he, unlike the Virginians who had that conflict, he came from, and again, I, I liken him to Hamilton, they didn't come from this gentry 
uh, uh, society where that was embedded. They they came from one where liberty was uh, was really practical, and that was why they advocated it. So let's go on, Andy. Just one, I have one more kind of short segment. So 1820s come around. In the 1820s, uh, Prepper James Monroe was the president, and Lafayette's older in life, and America as a country is growing and expanding, and they want to invite him for form a four month tour of the 13 colonies. You know, hey, you're, you know, you've been through a lot, pal. They're, they want to chop your head off over there. We want to recognize you. We want to celebrate you over here. How about you come over for four months? That's not enough, Andy. 16, 16 months. He's doing this incredible tour. Uh, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. As you said, in Boston, he goes to Bunker Hill, one of the most famous battles, takes dirt from Bunker Hill and says, I want to be buried. When, when I go back to France, I want this to be over my casket so I'm buried in American soil. Gives me goosebumps. So to repeat that, Andy, it just gives me goosebumps. And what a life, this man, what a legacy. And I think, Andy, that's a, a good cause to salute his heroism. Well, I think we can all salute the, you know, Gilbert de, de Motier, the uh, better known to history as the Marquis de Lafayette. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mar Marquis de Lafayette for what you did to aid the Americans and and uh, I hope you know that I, I think Lafayette was such a lover of America and uh, such an honest guy a rational guy that I think he would recognize that America repaid its debt in in World War One certainly World War Two and in the Cold War even after the French withdrew from NATO they weren't going to be able to stop the Soviets. It was only American presence in NATO that kept the, the Soviets from conquering Western Europe, including France. So I think the Americans have repaid their debt uh, to, to Lafayette and to France. But, you know, debt's repaid and everything. We respect Lafayette for what he, you know, for his great accomplishments. And we thank him for the inspiration he provides. And I think we, any, anything, any last words you want to say in this, Robert? Just not sitting on the sidelines. You see a battle, Andy, and even if you're, quote, privileged or wealthy, get involved in the cause of liberty. I think, to me, that's like the life lesson. While all of his peers and the nobility are just, you know, sipping wine, he's like, no, I'm going across the pond to fight, to defying the king's order. And so that's that's a that's a message, you know, in itself. No matter where you are, fight for the cause of liberty. That's heroic, right, sir? And so we we say, you know, from the from the depths of our hearts, merci, Monsieur de Lafayette. And and we will be back next week. Yeah, yes, yes. Au revoir. Right, not not adieu, but right, but au revoir till we meet again, right? Uh, and we will be back next week on the Hero Show once again with more, with more, you know, true stories of great men and women that will inspire us to be the heroes and heroines of our own lives. So we'll see you next week, everybody, on the Hero Show.